All right, so I will try to explain to you this, these two concepts uh, of the synthesis of antimalarial compounds at Open Notebook Science in the next 15 minutes. Well, this is actually a pretty good time to give this talk. Uh, this week we actually got our Wikipedia entry for Open Notebook Science. And it turns out that uh, it required a lot of people's coordinated efforts and it required a body of work before we were able to do this. But if you go on Wikipedia, you can learn a lot more that I don't have time to explain uh, today. The idea of Open Notebook Science is basically to report the work that you do in the laboratory in real time, or as close as you can to real time, so that the entire world knows as much as you do about your research. Uh, like I said, there's a number of references here that you can take a look at the <coughs> background of this. But the motivation is that, well, it should be self-evident that it's a way to do faster science, right, compared to either not disclosing some things or, you know, significantly delaying them. And I think it's also a way of doing better science, which is not immediately obvious, but I'll, hopefully I'll show you some examples of how that can be. Okay, now to the, to the synthesis part. So we're a synthetic organic chemistry group, and the, our target is uh, malaria, and specifically falsopane 2. Malaria, uh, as you should know, is a disease that's spread by mosquitoes, and here's actually the malarial parasite inside of the red blood cell. And it uses this enzyme, falsopane 2, to metabolize hemoglobin. So if we can inhibit that enzyme, it can be a way to basically stop the, the, the process of it replicating. And so what we've done is we've collaborated with a group at Indiana University, Rajarshi Guha, and he does the docking, which basically means that he takes the falsopane 2. <laughs> they fit, there's a chance that they might inhibit it. And so he tells us which compounds to make. And then we make them and we ship them off to UCSF, where Phil Rosenthal does the testing. So this <laughs> Social network to try to make it hosted by everyone else. Do a similar thing. And this is talk to interesting different groups that have done this. Openly, I was telling you about it's a way of doing better science, and it really comes down to where's the beef when you talk about your experiments. So, this is a blog post here where we are talking about doing different things. And it says, see experiment 150 for more information. So this is the Yugi reaction that I'll be mentioning over and over in this talk. And if you click on that link, it takes you to the lab notebook page, experiment 150. And this actually looks very similar to what it would look like in a paper notebook. And that's on purpose. We want to make things as easy as possible for people to get involved with open notebook science. So you have an objective, and you have all these different hyperlinks. So one of the things that you can link to, and this is a pretty long page, I'm just going to skip through it, give you examples. You can hit that Yugi Attic link, and it takes you to an entry in ChemSpider. ChemSpider is a free database that has over 21 million compounds. You can do substructure searching. You can do all kinds of things for free, and I don't have to worry about that on my server. So that's what we're trying to achieve here. We're trying to get high quality information processing without having to become computer scientists to do it. And that's becoming really possible to do. We also link to the docking procedure that our collaborator, Rajarshi, uses. Again, here the idea is that this is replicatable. Someone who has done docking before should be able to get enough information from this page to generate the same compounds in the same order. All right, so these are called SMILES codes, and they're convenient ways of representing molecular structures, and you can just dump them in, data, in, in um, spreadsheets. So it's a pretty convenient way. But again, this is all made explicit so you don't have to ask the researcher for permission. You can just go and look at the results. Another very uh, helpful thing is our spectra. Uh, if you know anything about organic chemistry, you know that the basis of it is spectra, especially NMR spectra. And there's actually a very neat way, if you have your NMR spectrum in a JCAMP format, you can run uh, JSpecView so that someone who doesn't know anything about Java or anything just hits this link and this spectrum pops up, and it's actually interactive. So you can use your mouse and drag across any peak, and it will expand it. So again, here, this is what I'm talking about doing better science. You know, maybe you didn't expand that peak in your paper. Maybe you didn't talk about it. But you know, if I'm trying to replicate this, or I'm trying to extend your research, maybe I'm interested in that peak. Maybe I want to measure it. And so you know, this is it's just more details. 
So by the time we end up with the final conclusion, and it says that this Yugi product was obtaining 59% yield, you don't have to take our word for it. It's all backed up either well or poorly, but it's all backed up. You know exactly what's supporting that statement. Uh, if you're not familiar with a wiki, uh, the reason that we use it for a lab notebook is that every time there's a change made, it tells you who made the change and exactly when, and we have a third-party timestamp for it. So we can claim that we knew what we knew exactly when, and we're not running the timestamp. It's run on a third party that's you know, well-respected. So that could be interesting down the road to settle claims. We can compare any two versions, and using Wikispaces, it lets you, it basically uh, shows you the stuff in green is the stuff that was added, the stuff in red was deleted. So it's a really nice way for, to understand what people are good at, right? Because this is a collaboration. Many people in a lab working together, certain people are good at things and other people are good at other things. And this is a really good way to keep track of all that. Now to find information, that's actually a big issue. Um, Obviously, if we just left it in the wiki like that, I mean, we have tags, we have ways of searching for the information, but you don't want to have to do that if you're interested in, you know, seeing a, a, the collection of experiments that we've run. So we've run this Yuki reaction several times, and we've modified the conditions. So we've used different starting materials, different solvent amounts, different concentrations, and we have sometimes gotten a nice precipitate that was pure product, and sometimes we don't. So we're trying to understand that. And we're using these Google Docs as a way of sharing that information in a very convenient way. So this is a spreadsheet. It works very similar to Excel, but it's free and it's hosted. So I'll show you an example of uh, an opportunity we had recently to use a robot for Mettler Toledo. And we're able to actually automate this optimization of this reaction. And this was done in collaboration with Dr. Owens. He did some statistical analysis, which I won't have time to get into. But the idea here is we wanted to find the highest yield, the conditions for highest yield. So we modified concentration, we modified the solvent, and we modified the excess of some of the reagents. So we actually did these reactions in little tubes that had a, a filter at the tip. So the robot added the, the four different components, and then it precipitated or it didn't. And if it did, we just you know washed it and then weighed the uh, result. And of course, took NMRs to make sure that we actually got the compound. So this is a picture of the robot, and it's basically just a syringe that goes and takes liquids out and uh, puts them. An interesting thing about using a robot is you get automatically um, the log of what the robot did, and it pays attention all the time. So it will record what it is it think it did. That's a double-edged sword. It gives you a lot of information. If you want to debug things, yeah, you absolutely have some good data to look at. But it also means because you're able to do so many more experiments, you have to be even more vigilant about systematic errors. And we've had that problem. And so you end up doing a 1,000 experiments before you find the problem, all right? But once you get it working, actually, this can be extremely uh, useful. So just to go to the final results here, um, so we did these experiments, and we had enough material to publish a paper. So here's another use of the wiki where we actually wrote the paper in the wiki. So every single draft was saved, and we can go back and see exactly how the paper was written. And the really nice thing about having a notebook to point to is, see, I can have reference nine, nine, uh, 11 be the melting point of the compound, and I can specify the batch that it was taken from, from experiment 99, whereas the proton NMR was taken from experiment 203, sample A11. So that information is typically not part of a, of a typical publication. You assume that the guy knows what, what he's doing and that he's actually characterizes his compounds properly. Well, that is not always the case, as we find out painfully. So here we can actually go and see if there's a problem with a specific batch if we're not getting the same information. Now, where we actually submit the, sub, submitted this paper is kind of interesting. It's called uh, Journal of Visualized Experiments, Jove. And so there's a written part to this that I just showed you. That was what we wrote on the wiki. And they actually sent some camera people to record our experiments. And so this is now under peer review, and we should hear back uh, you know, shortly about this. And I don't see any, any problems. I don't expect any problems. And so this will be a nice way to communicate you know, with, with video as well. So there's so many tools now that make communicating your science faster without losing anything. Another thing that the physicists have been using for a while is preprint servers. So chemistry really didn't have a good preprint server. Well, they did, but that's a whole other story. It's no longer working. So Nature actually recently came up with this Nature Precedings, which is a preprint server, and it's backed with 
the editorial filter of the Nature Publishing Group. If you're not familiar with Nature, it's one of the most well-respected uh, publishers out there. So if they basically say that this has good scientific quality, it's probably true. And so we can, before publication in Jove or any peer-reviewed journal that we choose to, to publish in, we can actually link to this document. People can comment on this document. They can vote on it. They can give us feedback. You can have versioning on here. All kinds of things you can do. Normally, when you have a paper out, you just tell people, well, you know, it's going to come out next week, and when it does, here's the link. Well, here, now you can actually give a link, and you have, you know, you can have your cake and eat it, too. So the bottom line here is we did find a maximum yield, 66%. We went in with a yield of about 49%, 50%. We got some increase. But the major result of this was really, you know, to prove that we could optimize a reaction using robotics. Now, and so far as the malaria project, <clears throat> that's actually important because that's how we make our compounds with this Yugi reaction. And so recently, we've actually gotten some results about this. We have four compounds that actually are active, both in inhibiting the enzyme, and they're also uh, effective in inhibiting the infection of Plasmodium falciparum. So, and these are in the micromolar range, so it's not bad. I mean, you know, it's, it's definitely publishable stuff. And there's different stories here. We used uh, one receptor area on the enzyme here. We used another receptor here. I don't have time to get into it, but it's kind of interesting the results that are coming out of this. And again, this is out in the open, and uh, we never know who's going to stop by to collaborate. A last little story. Uh, I, w I recently did a little trip in the UK, and uh, my friend here, Cameron Nalen, who also does open notebook science, although he uses a different system than I do, we had the chance to spend a day in the lab to do experiments. And one of the things that evolved from my trip um, is, a, is a new, very simple project uh, using um, open notebooks. And we uh, spent the day measuring solubilities. So we took a bunch of compounds and we took a bunch of organic solvents and measured the solubilities. And then we reported these solubilities in a Google Doc. Now this is actually very interesting. So for Bach glycine, right, and methanol, we're measuring 4.4 molar. And you notice that that's in green. And down here, um, for D-glucose and methanol, there's a, well, we do get a number, right, it's 0.05. But I put it in red and I don't actually include that number in my, five, in my final results because I'm not satisfied that I'm going to stand behind these. I don't think that 1.8 milligrams in the way that we were measuring it is good enough to report this. But what if you want a ballpark estimate? You can still access my number, and you have all the details of the context in which it was taken. So again, that's better science, I think. And what we're trying to do with this project, it's actually related to the malaria project in the sense that if we can uh, measure solubilities, report them publicly, and then build models, and Rajarshi Guha is going to help us build models of solubility, we should be able to predict the yields of these Yugi reactions in different solvents. So the idea is, is for this Yugi product, you should do it in 51% methanol, 4% ethanol, and the rest is nitrile. So that would be a very powerful thing that could be used not just for our project, but really anyone. And to sort of get this, this, this ball rolling, I set up this Open Notebook Science Challenge. And what it is is essentially, you know, we're asking people from around the world to contribute their measurements so long as they link them to a well-maintained notebook. And if they do that, then we can use these results and we can publish with them. You know, we can do everything that we, you know, that, that we do as scientists. And we have uh, a sponsor. Aldrich has actually volunteered to ship compounds anywhere in the world uh, to encourage people to do this. So I'm very excited about this. It's a new initiative and I think uh, has a good chance of working. And uh, there's you know, so many people to thank here. Khalid is uh, my grad student. Kevin Owens, you just heard from. Tim Bohinsky is an undergrad who, who just started uh, to, to, to work again in my lab this term, measuring solubilities. James is also an undergrad. Tom Osborne is the Mettler Toledo rep who was very patient and uh, took a lot of time to bring us the robot for us to, to, to get these results. Anthony Williams is the uh, guy who runs the ChemSpider, the, the database that I showed you for molecules. Andrew Lang uh, actually put our results into Second Life, and this <clears throat> because of the briefness of this talk, I wasn't able to get into that. But you can visualize the, the um, optimization of the reaction using 3D plots that you can rotate in Second Life. So Andy did that. And of course, uh, Cameron from Southampton. So uh, that's it. Any questions? <laughs>